Okay, hi everyone. Um, welcome to our talk today, which is part of the Chinese Studies Seminar at UNSW, co-hosted with the Australian Society for Asian Humanities. Uh, my name is Minerva Inwald. I'm Judith Nielsen Postdoctoral Fellow in Contemporary Art at the University of New South Wales. Um, and I'm also the Seminars Officer for the Australian Society for Asian Humanities. Um, before we start today, I would like to acknowledge that I'm on the land of the Wangal people of uh, the Eora Nation, and I would like to pay my respects to elders past, present, and future, as well as pay my respects to any uh, Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people who are here with us today. Okay, our seminar today um, is titled Xu Yu in the 21st Century, a conversation on literary translation. So the format is going to be a conversation between our two speakers, Frederick H. Green and John Von Kowalis. Uh, there will be some time for questions at the end as well. And if you do have questions, you can put them in the chat uh, throughout the talk. So I'm going to just quickly introduce our two speakers today. So uh, Frederick H. Green is Associate Professor of Chinese at San Francisco State University. He holds a BA in Chinese studies from Cambridge University and an MPhil and PhD in Chinese literature from Yale University. He has published widely on the literature and culture of the Qing dynasty and the Republican period, Sino-Japanese cultural relations, post-socialist Chinese cinema, and contemporary Taiwan. His book, Bird Talk and Other Stories by Xu Xu, Modern Tales of a Chinese Romantic, was published in 2020 by Stonebridge Press in Berkeley, California. Uh, and we will be, we'll provide you a link um, so that you can purchase a copy of the book um, if you are really taken with the discussion today. Um, our other uh, discussant here today is um, John Von Kowalis, who's Professor of Chinese Studies at the University of New South Wales in Sydney, as well as President of the Australian Society for Asian Humanities. He has published The Lyrical Lu Xun, a study of his classical style poetry, and The Subtle Revolution, Poets of the Old Schools during Late Qing and Early Republican China. He is currently completing an ARC discovery project on the um, formation of Lucian's early thought during his, um, during his time in Japan. Sorry, John, there's a word there I'm not sure about. Um, while, while working um, at the Foreign Languages Press in Beijing, John translates wit and humor from Old Cafe, a collection of pre modern from his jokes. Could everyone please make sure they're muted to remind people again? Okay, great. Um, so yeah, please do remain muted through the talk. Okay, so I'm gonna hand over to our two speakers now um, who uh, will get the conversation started. And remember, you can put your questions in the chat um, and there will be some time for questions at the end. All right, so thank you. Thanks very much, Minerva, for that introduction. And also thanks to everyone for coming. We have a, a healthy audience today in terms of size. Um, to introduce to you, um, I'd actually want to say one or two more things about uh, the speaker today, Frederick Green. Frederick Green's Chinese name is Ge Hao De. Uh, that's Hao Ran Zhi Qi, Dao De De, De Guo De De. And uh, Frederick is born and, and grew up in, in Northern Germany outside of Hamburg. Uh, he is the successor maybe one generation removed at San Francisco State uh, from another famous translator, and that is Howard Goldblatt. Howard Goldblatt's Chinese name is Ge Hao Wen. So the names are very similar, uh, but they are totally different people. And uh, as I think everybody in the audience knows, Howard Goldblatt's translations of Moyen uh, helped Moyen get the Nobel Prize in literature. Uh, and I think that in, in my opinion, uh, Frederick Green's ability as a translator exceeds uh, those the ability of, of uh, Howard Goldblatt. So I think that uh, uh, unfortunately Xu Yu has passed away, but I think if, if Frederick Green translates some living author, that person may very well have a, a chance at getting the Nobel Prize. To move on to uh, Xu Yu, um, he lived between 1908 and 1980. He himself pronounced his name Xi Yu, uh, the Xinhua Zidian. And 
also a number of scholars um, nowadays romanize it as shishi. Um, so we can pronounce it either way. Um, linguists tell us that we're supposed to take the pronunciation that the person himself uh, preferred, but um, history may move in another direction. Xu Xu was a, a very major figure in modern Chinese literature. He came originally from Zhejiang. He was educated at Beijing University in the late 1920s. He then went to Shanghai. He was befriended by Lin Yutang and Lu Xun. Um, by the 1930s, he was already serving as an editor of first-rate major literary journals like Ren Jian Shi in this human world. He went to Europe uh, in 1936 uh, and he studied philosophy at the Sorbonne in Paris. Uh, he was influenced in particular by uh, the French thinker Henri Bergson. And we also may see a hint of influence from Guy de Maupassant in the, the fact that some of his short stories have this uh, Guy de Maupassant style, uh, twist style of ending. Um, he then returned to China during the, uh, after the outbreak of the, the war to resist Japan in 1937. Uh, and he left Shanghai uh, for Chongqing after the um, international settlement was, was occupied by the Japanese. He became the most popular writer in all of free China by the end of the war. Uh, in particular, um, this was due to one Changpian Xiaoshuo, one full length novel, which he, he wrote uh, during this period called Feng Xiao Xiao, um, the, the wristling wind, the, the sighing of the wind, um, which was later made into a film and, and, and so on. So um, he achieved great prominence by the, the end of the war. However, by 1950, uh, right after uh, the communist takeover in 1949, uh, he left mainland China uh, for Hong Kong, where he uh, became a, an exiled writer. He continued writing amid straitened circumstances. He had uh, economic problems, um, and he um, eventually embarked on a wandering teaching career, which took him to India and also uh, to Taiwan. He refused overtures from the, the Chiang Kai-shek regime in Taiwan uh, to go there permanently. The Part of the reason, of course, is that he didn't want to live under a dictatorship. Uh, he had experienced that before in mainland China. He was a man of integrity. Um, I think if he had if he had put his fortune in with the right wing, um, he could have done very well, but he was a, really an intellectual of the third category. He was a person who did not want to affiliate either with uh, the communist movement in China or with the, um, the Chiang Kai-shek regime in Taiwan. And I, I think he could have done better uh, in Hong Kong as well. There were these writers who, who wrote for the CIA, like Zhang Aiding and, and some others. He didn't do that either. Um, ultimately, he became a professor of Chinese literature at Baptist College, and then uh, toward the end of his career, also a dean. So in, in that way, he had a, an academic career, which he established in Hong Kong toward the end of his life. I won't go on and on. Uh, I'll turn the floor over to Professor Green, uh, and I'd like Professor Green to tell us a bit more about his life and, and in particular his works and also your work of, of translating Xu Yu. Well, thank you. Um, thank you, Minerva, for the warm welcome. And thank you, John, uh, for inviting me today to talk about Xu Xu or Xu Yu, as you like to call him. I wish you hadn't said uh, you just said about Howard Goldblatt because I mean you just put the bar really high now. Um, Howard, of course, you know has been a huge inspiration for me and 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 a mentor. And it's quite funny what John said that it's true. Howard was actually a student at San Francisco State. He got his MA in Chinese, and then later he came back as a professor, uh, and then he he left. So um, and people, you know, that I have a Chinese name that sounds very similar is a coincidence, you know, that was given to me many years ago by a friend. Um, but then afterwards, people always ask me, are, are you, are, are you, 
you know, Howard Goldblatt's younger brother or something. <laughs> And I told this to Howard uh, at some point, and he said, well, you know, you can tell people you're my Shaudidi, I, I don't mind. So here you have it. Um, so, well, thank you again, you know, for this warm welcome and, and for letting me talk about uh, Xu Xu. I mean, you've, in a way, you've already said everything about him, um, almost everything. Thank you for that bio um, that saves me uh, talking about all of that. Um, and I like that you also pointed out that they had these two uh, readings of his name. So John insists on calling him Xu, which is very nice because that's actually the pronunciation that Xu Xu uh, preferred. Uh, let me, I have a PowerPoint that I'm going to share uh, occasion once in a while. Let me, oops, um, I'll do that now. Here we go. Um, and there's a photo of him. And so, you know, these two characters have multiple readings. And as John said, yes, the, the uh, Xu Yu preferred Xu Yu, but uh, when, he entered, when he was entered into the catalog of the Library of Congress in the US, his name was Romanized as Xu Xu because the character has two readings. So he kind of ended up as Xu Xu in, in Western scholarship and also now most Chinese refer to him. But John, I think Xu would have preferred it very much that you actually got it right and that you called him by the name that he preferred. So as John already pointed out, he, you know, Xu Xu really began his literary career in Shanghai in the 1930s under the auspices of Lin Yutang. He joined the Lin Yutang's uh, Lun Yu Pai. He was editor for several of the journals, and he also wrote uh, for these journals. He wrote mostly poetry at first, uh, but also essays, and then soon started to write fiction. And in his fiction, he embraced this, um, you know, cosmopolitan liberalism that we know from Lin Yutang, but also exoticism. So a lot of his stories are set in these distant, exotic places. Um, there's a lot of romance and there is this very distinct blend of idealism. Um, and I, I have a quote here from one of his early stories, The Goddess of the Arabian Sea, which is very typical of his early fiction in that it's both kind of set in a distant place, there's romance. Um, and this is uh, what, what one of the uh, protagonist or the protagonist, the male narrator, it's always a Chinese male narrator, I has to say, he says, I want to pursue all artistic fantasies because their beauty to me is reality. In this world, there are people who pursue dreams of the real, while uh, I seek out the real within dreams. And I think that really epitomizes um, his his sort of his take on the role of fiction and that idealism that uh, I, I referenced and that influence from Bergson that that John also hinted at. Now he then left uh, in 1936 for Paris to spend some time studying uh, in Paris. Um, and while he was in Paris, his first big literary success um, appeared back in Shanghai. It's a novella called Gui Lian or Ghost Love. And that story really made him uh, a literary celebrity. Uh, he later turned it, or it was first published in a journal in Yu Fang, another one of Lin Yutang's journals. Uh, and when he came back from Paris, he actually he rewrote it, it became a novella, it went through dozens of printing uh, by 1949. And it clearly struck a note uh, with the reading public um, in Shanghai and in China uh, at the time. And um, I was actually going to read a little passage from, um, from the story. And if anybody would like to follow along the Chinese, um, I'm going to also post, okay, a link. Actually, first I'm going to show you um, the, so this is this is the cover of the of the journal, and this is how uh, how it appeared, um, and this is the version that I translated. So I translated the the original one. It's a slightly 
shorter than the novella that uh, you know that he rewrote. And I'm going to okay. So here's the link. This is just so it's just the first page. If 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 you if you're curious and you want to follow along, so here's the opening of Gui Lian, Ghost Love. What I'm about to relate happened six or seven years ago on a wintry evening around midnight. I was walking out of Xiangfen Alley and onto Nanjing Road. The moment I turned the corner, right there by the tobacco store, I saw a woman entirely dressed in black. There was an incomparable pureness to her beauty, and strange as it might sound, I had the impression that somehow she looked familiar, yet I could not recall then where it was that I had seen her before. Was it because I was drawn to her beauty or because I wanted to figure out where I had seen her before. In any case, I could not help but throw another glance at her. I also no longer remember now whether that tobacco shop handed out matches or had an incense coil for the customers to light their cigarettes. But just as she turned around, she let out a puff of smoke from the cigarette she was smoking, and I got a whiff of its aroma. I'm a bit of an expert when it comes to recognizing the smell of tobacco. Maybe it is a kind of talent, while studying at various universities in Europe, I attended lectures by maybe 20 professors, and I recognized them all by the tobacco. The hint of the tobacco, even with doors closed, was enough for me to tell who was standing in front of the door or walking past. Thus, the moment I smelled her cigarette, I know she was smoking a pinhead. Pinheads were a popular uh, British tobacco uh, cigarette brand in Shanghai at the time. Surely pinheads were a little strong for that lady, and I immediately assumed that she must be a heavy smoker with blackened teeth. What a pity to have such exquisite beauty spoiled by a row of blackened teeth, I thought. I was already on my way again when she suddenly interrupted my thoughts. Human, tell me the direction to Shia Tu Road. I jumped with bewilderment. As she spoke, I was able to see her teeth, or I should say her teeth grabbed my attention. They shone bright white like a precious sword under the moon. But once she had closed her mouth again, I also noticed a particularly fierce look in her eyes. Her face, which at first had been lit up by the shop's red neon lights, was in fact silvery white and drained of all color. Her lips looked especially sallow and bloodless. Had she put on too much powder? Was she recovering from an illness? Still contemplating, I almost asked, why didn't you put on some rouge? But it was she who spoke again. Sheer to road, I said, sheer to road. It suddenly occurred to me that the reason she looked so pale might be because her clothes were all black. She was wearing a black chipao, black coat, black stockings, and black shoes. I also noticed that her clothes seemed much too thin. They were all single layer, and the coat did not have a fur lining. Besides, her stockings were made of silk, and she was wearing high heels. Could it be that her face was white from cold? I wanted to look at her fingernails, but she was wearing a pair of fine white gloves on her hands, one of which was holding the cigarette she was smoking. Human, why are you looking at me like that? Her face was solemn, but overwhelmingly beautiful. It now made me think of the face of a silver female bust I had seen in a shop window somewhere along Avenue Joffre in the French concession of Shanghai. So that was why I had thought that I had seen her before. The beauty of her face lay in its harmonious structure that lacked any crudeness. I felt a little comical about my déjà vu experience, but nevertheless put on a serious face and said, even when asking for directions, you should be a little polite. Fine if you don't want to call me sir or master, but how about a simple mister? What's this business calling me human? You're neither a goddess nor the almighty. Actually, I was thinking that her beauty had something rather divine, and so my last sentence had been spoken somewhat inadvertently. I'm not a goddess, she replied. I am a ghost. So um, here you have the opening. Um, and I should say, if anybody <laughs> is now really curious and you would like to read the entire story, you can actually read ghost, the entire Ghost Love Guilian on the website of Stonebridge Press. Um, and uh, I think Minerva is going, yeah, uh, is going to post the link um, to, the, to the publisher and uh, they have a reader on the website. So 
<laughs> you can you can read the whole you can read the end of it over to you john look um the first time i encountered the story Gui Lian was actually not as a text but uh as a filmic adaptation which was made in in mainland china in 1995 and having watched it, in fact, I, I watched it with uh, Xi Yinbai, who is the daughter of Xi Yu. And after we watched it, we both got the feeling that this is actually not a ghost story, um, that the ghosts are used metaphorically. And as you follow the story, you find out she's actually not a ghost. She's a human being who holds herself forth as a ghost simply because the human world has become too tragic, uh, too awful to live in uh, as a human being. So uh, I was thinking at the time I saw the film that it, in a way, this may be an allusion to um, the execution of the Zolian Wu Lia Shi, the five martyrs of the League of Left Wing Writers, which happened in, in January or February 1931. And this was a group of people that Lu Xun was deeply involved with, uh, and Xi Yu may himself have had a connection to, um, either direct or indirect. So uh, in a way, I see more than romance and more than, than ghost stories in, in Xi Yu. I see some veiled references uh, to the politics of the time. And I think that that's the thing that, that makes him really great is that like Lu Xun, and well, this is uh, Takeuchi Yoshimi's formulation, like Lu Xun, he doesn't engage politics directly, but he engages it from the sidelines. And in this way, uh, he in fact engages it more effectively. Um, and I think that's one of the things that, uh, that he may either have learned from Lu Xun or he may be very similar to Lu Xun Yin. When I think about Dang Dai Wen Xue, right, uh, contemporary Chinese literature, that is the literature written after 1978 or so, um, partially as a reaction to the Cultural Revolution, we have this theme of Ren Yu Gui de Jiu Chan, right, the entanglement between humans uh, and ghosts. And in, in many ways, this also alludes to the, um, the cruelty of the Cultural Revolution, uh, the people who were killed. Um, and so we, we, in, in that sense, what Xi Yu is doing with the white terror, I think, continued uh, afterwards uh, in, into uh, contemporary Chinese literature, uh, this, this way of using ghosts uh, as a metaphor uh, for something else. And of course, Xi Yu also engages the um, Japanese invasion, uh, the collaborationist regime. Uh, and uh, in a way, I think he is the founder of this whole uh, genre of spy novels set in occupied Shanghai, uh, which of course was continued by the filmmaker Li An, when he adapted Zhang Aling's uh, novella, uh, Se Jie, uh, Last Caution to the, the Silver Screen. But it's also become a whole genre uh, in mainland China now. There are all these, these spy thrillers, in particular made for TV movies, uh, which are set in occupied Shanghai. So I think, in a way, uh, this is another continuation of Xu's influence into the 21st century. I'll, uh, hand this back to you. Oh, I should ask another question at this point. If, if you want to respond, fine, but I, I would like to move on to um, Hong Kong. How did his fiction change in Hong Kong? Okay, Let, I, I do want to say a couple of words with you, what you said, because everything you said was, I mean, it was, was so interesting um, and, and, and really insightful. So, you know, one thing I, I, I should have point out is that in, is this, especially in his earlier stories, um, they, and you're right about that, they technically are not really ghost stories in the traditional sense. Um, they usually are devoid of really the uncanny. Um, there's usually some explanation, a, a rational explanation, like in 
you know, in Guilian, um, to what is really the origin of that ghostly encounter. Um, and often it's a dream, you know, often it's just a dream and the narrator wakes up, like in the goddess of the Arabian Sea, for example. And that, of course, again, sort of resonates with that quote I had on the PowerPoint about seeking out the real within dreams. And right, there's really that idealistic tendency and we see, you know, Bergsonian influence or, you know, the romantic, romantics, really, um, right? And um, it's that, and we can talk about that later, that really ultimately led to the clash with, with you know, the literary left and, and Marxist critics and, and also why he left um, eventually for Hong Kong. You did mention Lu Xun, of course, everybody, all, all writer, I think, in, in the 1920s or 30s in Shanghai would have admired Lu Xun, um, you know, even if they maybe disagreed on some levels and politics. And, Lu, uh, and Xu Xi was no exception. He greatly, greatly admired um, Lu Xun and they even met and, and uh, Lu Xun was actually very fond of, of, of Xu Xi. Um, but um, you know, um, so so it's this this idealistic tendency that that I really call his romantic tendency, and and I sort of discuss, uh, you know, Xu Xu in the, in the afterword to the book, for example, in the context of uh, romanticism. And again, we can talk about that um, maybe a little later. I did want to respond to what you said about the political subtext uh, of the story. Actually, let me share my slides one more time. Um, because you know what's really interesting is in especially in this story, but of course in a lot of fiction from uh, Shanghai from you know the pre-war period, the geography of the city plays a really interest, uh, important uh, role. And you know the narrator and the ghost or, or this this ghostly lady, they walk a lot. They walk at night. They walk through the city, and we really can follow them. They start out in Nanjing Road, and they walk through the international settlement, and then. You know, along Avenue Joffre, and she wants to go to Xie Tu Road at the at the bottom, and they walk around there. They meet again later, and they spend they walk a, around a lot in in Longhua, and Longhua, of course, is you know is a district well known for its Buddhist temples and pagodas, and they also walk around there. But of course, in 1937, and John, you're absolutely right about that. That was the location of one of the most dreaded KMT prisons, where many of those leftists. Um, you know, first those who had been betrayed by Chiang Kai-shek in 1927, April 12th, right, that purge uh, of the communists, but also just, you know, later on uh, uh, were, were detained and many of, of whom, of course, were executed. And Xu Xu himself, you know, he, he wrote later on that he, you know, as, as a young man, he, he had been sympathetic to the socialist cause. I think most young people in China, probably in the 1920s or 30s, had you know, on, on some level being sympathetic to that cause. But, you know, when he was in France, he uh, read about the Stalinist purges and he sort of became estranged from communism as an institutionalized uh, uh, political system. Um, and, you know, the mysterious woman in the story, she appears to allude to the events of 1927 and the socialist cause, um, but, you know, she herself, in a way, like like Xu Xu, she, you know, she she then, of course, chooses to live. I don't want to give away too much of the story. <laughs> you kind of already did, John. But she, of course, she sort of chooses to to live this withdrawn life as a ghost, and in a way, renounces, you know, the the revolution herself. So I think you're right. I mean, in this story especially, there is a political undertone, and he does that in some other stories as well. And while they, on the surface, often appear to be just these exotic tales, um, they there is actually, if you look, uh, a, a sort of often a subtle political undertone. But um, it's that subtleness, I think, that does make them so interesting. Um, you mentioned, you know, the shift in his writing that we see after he went to Hong Kong. So let me say a, a f just a few words uh, about that. Um, so yeah, you mentioned, oh, actually, and something else you mentioned, you mentioned so much um, that, uh, you know, sort of him writing the spy fiction 
uh, during the war years, which of course was very, very popular at the time, but which is you know, also sort of seeing a resurgence now. Uh, here's that novel, The Rustling Wind, Feng Xiaoxia, that he uh, published in 1942 in Chongqing. So he, after his time in France, he goes back to Shanghai, but you know, once Shanghai is occupied, uh, or the international settlement is, is occupied by the Japanese following Pearl Harbor, he also leaves, he goes to Chongqing, he writes that, uh, uh, you know, that wartime epic, really. Um, and it was later turned into a movie, into uh, TV adaptations in, in Taiwan. Um, and, um, you know, I would have loved to, to translate that, but of course that's way too long. That's in Chinese is like 600 pages. I forgot how many characters it is, but he actually does have a couple of other really fun, uh, sort of spy stories. And one of them found its way, uh, into, um, my anthology. It's a story called the Jewish Comet, Yo Tai De Hui Xiang, which, uh, you know, has a lot of the elements that later find their way into Feng Xiao Xiao. Um, but um, what's what's really, really interesting is that it's also one of the very few stories set in Shanghai that actually comments on the presence of, of Jews uh, in Shanghai. And I'm sure a lot of you are familiar uh, uh, with, with the really fascinating story of the Jewish population in Shanghai. There are several waves and the last, of course, came um, just prior to World War II when a lot of Central European Jews uh, escaped to Shanghai and Xu Xu picks up on that and the female narrator, uh, not sorry, the, the female protagonist in the story is one of those uh, Jews. So, um, you know, so much to that, you know, spy genre that Xu Xu in a way, yeah, helped to, to, to create or popularize. Um, but, you know, so this fiction then, especially his pre-war fiction, especially, especially stories like Guili and Ghost Love, from which I read the opening, um, was soon heavily criticized by leftist critics all throughout the 30s. Here's a quote from Baren. He compares it to a bomb full of poison capable of extinguishing the fighting spirit of thousands of revolutionaries. And then in 1945, uh, uh, an essay is published by another Marxist critic, Shi Huai Chi, which is specifically dedicated to Guilian. And it's a scathing criticism. Um, you know, I have the quote up here in, in Chinese and in English. I'm just going to read out the English. It will invariably cause you to forget the cruel reality of the world, cause you to ignore the hideous scars of our nation, um, lead you to distance yourself from that cruel struggle between old and new that is currently being carried out all around us. And he also compares it to a syringe filled with poison. And then he he urges his readers to throw it into the cesspool. And, you know, um, it was criticism like this that made Xu Xu realize that his pre-war fiction really would become a liability in, you know, sooner or later. Um, and that is why in 1950, he leaves, he leaves the newly founded People's Republic of China for Hong Kong um, on what he thinks would be a temporary exile. Um, I think most exiles thought that, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll let some time pass and we'll be able to go back, but um, he never returned. So it would, it was, it would become his, you know, his, his exile for life, um, so to speak. Now he did continue to be a very prolific writer um, in Hong Kong. And, um, you know, of course, in part because he had been so popular, he really was one of the most widely read authors of the, the wartime period, certainly pre-war and wartime period. And, um, you know, one of the first works that he publishes in, in Hong Kong is this novella Miao Yu or Bird Talk, which is also the title story of, of, the, of the translation. Here is the, 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 the cover of, uh, of, of the book. Um, and it's, it's really a lovely novella it was incidentally also Lin Yutang's favorite novella by Xu Xu and one of his most famous uh, f favorite short stories in, in modern Chinese literature in general. Uh, he said that several times. Um, and, you know, you ask about his, the changes in, in, in sort of his style of writing, and there certainly were some, some changes. Um, so if, you know, in his pre-war work, we often have 
these very confident first person narrators being enticed by mysterious women or looking for romance in foreign countries, the first person narrator in his Hong Kong works is now usually an exile looking for lost happiness, uh, always in search for lost love, a lost home, a time to which there was ultimately no return. You know, the Republican period, of course, it ended. The Cold War was now a new reality. Um, and, you know, the, the narrator then in his Hong Kong work is, is, is often a guest in transit, uh, an exile full of nostalgia, really. And I wanted to read, if we have time, just a short passage from, uh, from, from Bird Talk, from Niao Yu, because I, I really think it epitomizes very well that, that new narrative style, that new narrator that we have. And um, I'm going to do the same thing if anybody wants to follow along with the Chinese. I'm going to post, okay, just those pages from which I'm going to read out into the chat. Um, so it's a passage from chapter 13 and then from the ending. Um, so you can, you can click on that. So, um, so here we go then. This is from uh, Niao Yu. And the story, um, you know, the story is set in post-war Hong Kong, where the narrator has ended up after years of drifting. And he receives then a letter um, that triggers a flashback that takes him back to the pre-war Chinese countryside. And the letter informs him of the passing of his former fiance. And, and it's that, um, you know, that flashback then that takes us uh, uh, to the pre-war uh, Chinese countryside. Um, and it's there that he meets this girl uh, who is slighted by everybody in this, you know, in, in, in this village. He's, he goes back to this village, um, his ancestral village to, to recover from an illness. And, and he meets this girl and this girl exhibits these qualities that today we probably might describe as autistic. Um, and he soon discovers that she has these, this very unusual talent that she can communicate with birds. Um, and I'm going to read you the passage where he discovers that. So, I became determined to find out what she was actually up to. I rose early one moment, uh, one morning, even before the birds had begun to sing. The sky was not yet completely light, and I went into the garden to find a place that was close enough to the fence where she usually stood, yet also hidden by the bamboo thicket. Then I waited for her. It was a hazy morning. The sky was colorless, except for a faint red glow in the east. Soon the birds in the bamboo thicket started to sing. At first, there was only one, chirping away in a clear and captivating way and flying from branch to branch. Another one began to sing as if answering the other. Just then I heard a response from beyond the fence and I caught sight of the girl wearing a gray dress, her hair done up in two braids. A chorus of birds began chirping away from inside the bamboo thicket. The two birds that had sung to each other flew to the fence and began trilling at the girl on the other side. The girl raised her head. Her face was round and her eyes shone brightly. She bore a happy smile. The sounds she was making were beautiful. They neither sounded like the trilling of birds, nor did they sound like singing. The girl and the two birds seemed like old acquaintances. The birds flew back and forth between the fence and her shoulder and then landed on the fence and chirped affectionately. By then, the morning haze had already disappeared and the sun shone onto the dewy grass. I was able to see the girl's face clearer now. Her chin was pointed and she had thin lips, a delicate nose and a broad forehead. Her eyes were radiant. What was most astonishing was her skin. It seemed as if it had rarely been exposed to the sun. It was of a very light complexion, like porcelain, not at all like that of other country folk. Suddenly, a bird flew into the bamboo thicket. Had it noticed me? It called out from the inside and then came flying out again. I could see that the girl was looking straight at me now, and I thought it best to come forward 
and greet her. Um, and then let me just read a couple of lines from the ending. So what happens is that he, you know, the narrator tries to teach her math and writing, but it's all futile. Um, just as futile as she trying to teach him bird talk, which he really wants to learn from her. Um, and it's only when they're reading poetry together that she sort of experiences the same sublime pleasure as when listening to bird talk. And he eventually, you know, the, he, he wants to take her to Shanghai. He takes her to Shanghai to live with her, uh, with, with him and his family. But in Shanghai, she's deeply unhappy and they decide to live in the countryside together. Um, he's sort of fallen in love with her by then. And they travel to a Buddhist convent. Um, and it's in this Buddhist convent that she again displays this intuitive understanding of, of Buddhist sutras. And um, this is what then happens. She did not belong with me. She belonged in a world unspoiled by worldly matters. Only in such a world could her sublimity and magnificent magnificence manifest itself. Only in such a world could she truly feel at ease and be happy. I would be of no help or value to her. I had become superfluous. In fact, I had become an emotional burden to her, just like she had been a burden to me in Shanghai. What was there left to say? I did not see Yunqian again. Early the next day, I descended the hill and immediately returned to Shanghai. My life in Shanghai returned to its usual grind. Petty quarrels and social engage engagements kept me busy, and I had my sh fair share of ups and downs. I was hoping that I would quickly forget Yunqian, yet she would invariably appear in my mind in moments of fatigue and loneliness, even though our worlds were so far apart. In the years that followed, I wandered aimlessly. I indulged in wine and women. I got worn down by poverty and sickness, living out of tiny rooms. I threw myself into frivolous affairs and participated in noisy brawls. I changed from one job to the next, drifted from place to place. I married, got divorced, raised kids, went to America and Europe. I sold my songs and my stories and everything else to make ends meet. And in the end, I drifted to Hong Kong. I forgot Yunqian, I forgot her a long time ago, but every time I travel to the countryside and gaze at the mountains and streams and the lush forests, I hear the distant singing of birds. The figure of Yunqian faintly flashes into my memory, but it's just like a fleecy cloud drifting by in the sky. And as soon as I return to my mundane existence, I forget her again. How many times had I thought of writing her a letter to ask how she was doing, but when I looked at my own vulgar life, I could never master the courage to disturb her pure and peaceful soul. Um, I leave it at that for now. Uh, over to you, John. <laughs> Sorry, John, you're muted. Sorry. Well, there's one thing that very much impressed me about all these five stories. Uh, Gui Lian, Ghost Love. Yo Tai Da Hui Xing, uh, the Jewish comet, Niao Yu, bird talk, Bai Ling Shu, the, the All Souls tree, and finally, like Gao Sheng Lu, the Yikan Yu Ran, this is the one which is set in Hong Kong, right? Uh, when Ah Hyang uh, came to Go Sen Road. One thing that really struck me is how strong the female characters are. The women take the lead in all of these and they boss the men around. They tell the men what to do. Um, I think that in understanding um, his fiction as, as the work of a romantic, that may get lost in the generalization. If you read the works, I think everyone is going to be struck by the, the strength of the female characters. Whether they are ghosts or claim to be ghosts or whatever, and they do so for a reason. Uh, they're making a point. Uh, the girl uh, in Niao Yu, in Bird Talk, who is thought by the villagers to be a dimwit, uh, is actually very smart. And she's smart in a, an artistic way, right? She, uh, as you said, uh, intuitively understands sutras, but also uh, Tang poetry and classical Chinese poetry. So this is, uh, this is certainly uh, an incredible mind. Um, one thing that I like 
very much about the afterword of your book is how you differentiate the type of writing that he began to produce in Hong Kong from what is commonly characterized as a literature of nostalgia. And that reminded me of my own reading of Bai Xianyong's uh, Yo Yuan Jing Ma, Wandering Through the Garden, Waking from a Dream. At the very end, when this well-to-do hostess sees off the, the, the widowed Quinn opera singer uh, as they're waiting for the taxi to arrive. Uh, and the, the opera singer looks out into the, the horizon and says, oh my, look how many um, high-rise buildings are springing up all over Taipei, right? So this, this idea of the intrusion of modernity, the Chinese world is changing. And you suggest that there's a certain modernity formulated in Xu Yu's fiction of this later period. Uh, he seems to have moved on in Hong Kong from a literature of nostalgia, which is often the way PRC literary critics typically view the writing of exiled authors from mainland China. He moves beyond this into a new understanding that displacement is part of the modern situation. And, and intellectuals are often the diaspora now. You're in the diaspora as someone from Germany uh, who studied uh, Chinese literature uh, and went to Japan and is now teaching in, in San Francisco. I'm in the diaspora as, as an American who studied Chinese literature and ended up in Australia. So in, in a sense, this is part of the whole uh, modern milieu. Um, and I think it's something that he, he grasps and, and reflects in his, his later fiction. I'll stop there. Wow. Um, le yeah, let me just say a few words in, in response to that, and then maybe we can open it up. Let's still have a little bit of time for questions. You know, I'm so glad, John, that you're picking on, uh, you know, up on that. I think Shushu's use of nostalgia is really, really interesting. And it's not only connected to his exile, to that physical exile, but it was really also an aesthetic gesture that, you know, that started to take shape in his pre-war work. Um, but that really becomes evident in his in his Hong Kong work. Um, and, you know, nostalgia was a way for Xu Xu, yes, of course, to give expression to, you know, that sense of loss that he himself had experienced and many others had experienced, but also, and that is, I think, more important, the sense of metaphysical homelessness. And, you know, in the afterward, I'm, I'm drawing on the work of a philosopher, uh, Michel Levy, who has worked a lot on romanticism, and he understands the romantic critique of modernity as bound up with an experience of loss. The romantic vision is characterized by the painful and melancholic conviction that in the modern age, uh, something precious has been lost. Certain essential human values have been alienated, but humans have also become alienated from nature or maybe a more intuitive understanding of reality um, and and this alienation of often experienced as as exile Levy quotes uh, the romantic philosopher Friedrich Schlegel as speaking of the soul uh, the seed of humanness as living under the willows of exile unter den Trauerweiden der Verbannung I have to bring in a German quote here <laughs> and it's precisely this sense of metaphysical um, homelessness, I believe, that lies at the root of this nostalgic longing expressed in, in Xu Xu's Hong Kong work. This is maybe all a little abstract, so let me um, give you one tangible visual example. Uh, so let me share one last time the, the, the slides. So, um, you know, like Xu Xu's fiction, the painting of Marc Chagall, who himself, of course, was also an immigrant, right, in exile, first living in Paris, later in New York. It's also Im imbued with nostalgia. The past becomes the same kind of pre-Lepsarian Eden as maybe the Republican period uh, or, or the pre-war Chinese countryside does in Xu Xu's Hong Kong stories. Yet nostalgia is not the expression of a yearning for a concrete place or time. Uh, instead, the past and the people and places that come alive in Chagall's dreamscapes are artistic sanctuaries for his inner self. Um, and Xu Xu must have sensed 
a kind of artistic affinity, I think, to Chagall, so much so that he chose to adorn the cover of uh, one of his anthologies from Hong Kong, Xiao Ren Wu de Shang Ji. It's translated as uh, Step by Step, Mr. Everyman, uh, with a painting from Chagall, Ciel d'Hiver. Uh, so it's really this, you know, creative engagement, I think, with this kind of, uh, uh, you know, romantic uh, uh, modernist nostalgia that connects Xu Xu to a larger modern, uh, uh, global literary uh, artistic modernity, I think. And, and that, uh, you know, I think that gives additional, I think, importance to it's maybe especially his work from Hong Kong, because Hong Kong literature is really often, you know, left out of the canon of modern Chinese uh, literature. Um, so maybe leave it at that. And, and maybe, uh, unless John, you, you have something else, we could all... You can't show the clip from the film, can you? Um, sure, sure. Okay. Um, there is a, so a lot of Xu Xu's works, especially the Hong Kong works were uh, later turned into movies and of course cinema becomes uh you know the, the probably the most important cultural genre in post-war hong kong and xu xu was actually involved in the making of a lot of these uh movies he wrote the screenplay and there's one in particular uh mang lian blind love where he had a cameo role it's a beautiful uh story actually i should put the link to the entire movie it's on youtube into the chat you can watch it on your own but um, so the movie opens with Xu Xu actually showing up on a cemetery in, in Hong Kong and picking up a manuscript, which ends up being the, the actually the story that is then turned into a movie. And he takes the manuscript to a party where the who is who of the Hong Kong, uh, formerly Shanghai movie industry is assembled. And all these people are actually starring in the movie. And John is particularly fond of that that clip. So uh, let me let me just show that real quick. It's just a two minute clip. And if you have questions in the meantime, you can post them into the chat and maybe we have time to answer one or two. Okay, so here's that clip. Yoinyanda 我看见墓碑上写着后来我到一个朋友的家里去那儿有许多电影店的朋友蒋光超啊贺冰啊陈厚啊钟情啊威力啊罗维啊还有王元龙他们都随便的在聊天啊李丽华小姐也来了真巧极了大家不约而同的全聚到这儿来了
，并且把这部稿子的来源说了出来。他们很想知道其中的内容，就叫我念给大家听。这是一个伤心跟伤感的故事，里边的生命是可爱而可怜的，他们的命运是凄惨而凄凉的。OK. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much to um, both Frederick and John today for such a um, uh, for such a sorry for such a um, fascinating discussion of both literature, but also the kind of historical context in which Xu Xu was writing.